Illinois faces some big challenges. Today, we're about to hear a truly honest analysis of the problems we face. Equally as important, you'll also hear an in-depth discussion of some practical solutions. This is your radio source for stories, the insight, and the answers you won't hear anywhere else. Not in the media and not coming from Springfield. You're listening to Illinois Rising, presented by the Illinois Policy Institute. Now, here's your host. AM 560's Dan Proft. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and welcome to another edition of Illinois Rising. Uh, Dan Proft is out on vacation at an undisclosed location for the time being, Uh, but we do expect him back in January, unlike the thousands of people that fled Illinois in 2016. I'm Joe Kaiser filling in with my colleague Hillary Gowans, the Director of Content Strategy at the Illinois Policy Institute. Hillary. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Joe. Uh, a lot of the things we talked about in the past year, from budget issues to um, just the tax burden op- op- imposed on Illinoisans, um, covered a, a wide range of things that affect everyday Illinoisans and people who, like I just mentioned, the out-migration issue, things that people are really keeping a close eye on. But one thing that the Illinois Policy Institute adopted and has followed more closely in recent years, and I know you write about a lot, at IllinoisPolicy.org and the Huffington Post is criminal justice reform, which um, is getting a lot of bipartisan. Um, is the public support for criminal justice reform? I know we've talked about it on this show before, but um, within Illinois, getting people's attention on the issue and, and why it really matters. Right. So there is a lot of bipartisan support, like you said. Um, an overwhelming majority of Illinoisans realize that the system's broken. Um, And they know that we should do something about it. And Illinois Policy Institute's actually put out a lot of great solutions to fix the problem. Um, And we're hoping to see movement on them in 2017. Uh, But one of the reasons that criminal justice reform is so important, you know, it's important on its own, um, but it doesn't stand alone as an issue. Um, The broken system that we see today and the people who are trapped in it, these are this is a byproduct of every other government failure. It's a byproduct of broken schools, of a failing economy where people can't get good work. Um, so the people who are stuck in prisons and jails across the state, uh, you know, every time government touches them, they are left worse off. And that's why we care so much about this, because you know, we have to help figure out solutions, not just to help stop the outflow of everyday people leaving Illinois, but also to get people back on their feet so they're not trapped in prison or jail. And I like how you you painted that as another government failure, because this has traditionally been something that a lot of people on the left would gravitate toward. But I think in recent years, more so, you have people on the right and people across the political spectrum kind of listening to what the problems are with the criminal justice system and then coming together on solutions. And I want to bring on uh, Derek Cohen, who is the deputy director at the Right on Crime campaign down in Texas, which does a lot of great work on, on criminal justice reform to help us kind of paint this picture a little bit more and, and uh, d- describe why the, the uh, criminal justice reform is such an important issue across the political spectrum. Derek, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. So just to get started, Hillary and I were talking a little bit about how, how and why people, I mean, everyday Illinoisans or people in Texas, people just across the country should and would be interested in criminal justice reform. If you were talking to let's say, just your average voter, maybe a center-right person, how would you pitch the importance of criminal justice reform proposals to them? Well, certainly. I think the, the elephant in the room on that is, is simply the cost. You know, if we, if we aggregate all uh, dollars paid into the justice system uh, across the board, you know, a 2012 estimate by Bureau of Justice Statistics actually has that about $285 billion. And, I mean, of course, that's, you know, policing, courts, and corrections. Um, you know, with 86 of which being uh, corrections just in and of itself. So the, the fiscal note on this is, is just completely inignorable. Um, moreover, this represents, especially to those on the, uh, on the uh, center right, you know, this is, a government, this is a government function. You know, we need to have the same uh, scrutiny, the same um, guarantees on efficiency and, and proper use that we do everywhere. Just because this encroaches on areas uh, of public safety and things that have more of a visceral appeal doesn't mean they should be immune from any sort of scrutiny. Uh, and then you also have just the abstract uh, issue of liberty. You know, there are issues where, you know, I'm sure you and uh, and all your friends have said at one point or another, there ought to be a law. Uh, well, after 50 years of 
the, of there ought to be a law. We definitely have a lot of laws. You know, estimate on the federal level alone, you know, we have about 4,500 actual criminal offenses articulated, about uh, 300,000 plus existing outside uh, in regulatory codes. So these are all things that can lead to jail time, but they're things that we generally don't put any check on because we consider uh, or because we usually avoid having any sort of scrutiny on this particular aspect of government. So, Derek, this is Hillary here. Um, I know that you just mentioned the excellent points of the uh, the immense cost um, and just the failure of the system. Um, but I, I want to push you a little bit more on this. I think a lot of people are really confused when they see people like Rand Paul and Governor Bruce Rauner up here in Illinois talking about the need for criminal justice reform. There's sort of this idea that Republicans in particular aren't or shouldn't be part of the criminal justice movement. So why do you think that that is wrong? Well, I think it's wrong personally because if we look at what the one of the central functions of government is, it is to provide for the public safety. The policies that we've enacted, um, you know, both federally and at the state level, and in almost all states, actually worsen public safety. If we use incarceration specifically as a as a knee jerk punishment, as opposed to finding a punishment that fits the crime or a way that can actually uh, increase monitoring to make sure that uh, the recidivism rate uh, is lowered and that the individual um, criminogenic risks of each offender are addressed. If we just have one monolithic policy, we're not addressing those, and that actually leads to worsen public safety. Uh, so at the very, very least, we should look at this from a, are we getting the public safety return uh, on investment that we, uh, that we deserve? And I think that's interesting because, like Hillary mentioned, people being confused maybe by Bruce Rauner being for criminal justice reform or Rand Paul working with Cory Booker in the U.S. Senate. The thing is, you can't just pick it. If you're going to be a, a fiscal conservative or a fiscal hawk, you don't want to pick and choose what issues you're going to care about cutting spending. So to, to actually be uh, like a, a fiscal hawk or to say that you have a, a great urgency on fiscal issues, you should really care about the criminal justice system and take a good hard look at it because there's a lot of waste or a lot, like you said, not a lot of good return on investment in public safety. Mm. Certainly, certainly. And, you know, this actually illustrates a lot where I, I think Governor Rauner, uh, Senator Paul, and, and many of the conservatives that are active on this really separate from the left. You know, the we, and I say we uh, collectively, uh, both as right on crime and, and conservatives engaged in criminal justice reform, you know, we see this as a, as a government function, but we just demand a, a better result from it. You know, we can't pick and choose where we turn blind eyes to, and we really need to be, be enacting laws that, uh, that get the results that we need. Now, the left, on the other hand, tends not to have that as, you know, they never met a uh, spending package they didn't like, um, but it's usually uh, motivated more by uh, some theories of racial justice, um, uh, ones that I don't tend to agree with, and it also doesn't tend to turn an eye towards public safety. So we definitely are arriving at similar conclusions, but we get there through very different paths. Right. So let's talk about some of the solutions that you're proposing or pursuing, and maybe some of the solutions that other states have already enacted. Certainly, certainly. Well, I mean, we'd have to go back all the way to 2007. Uh, we've, we did a very minor tweak, actually, in 2007, where we were facing having to build 17,000 additional prison beds and with a, a five-year cost just on the uh, capital improvements alone, about $2.1 billion. So, you know, that's, you know even, even in a state with a budget as large as Texas, that's not, you know, that's not change. Um, so one thing that we had to do is we had to look at how are we actually filling these facilities, and we saw that we had uh, a very easy procedural path where people could get in for low-level offenses, they could get in on uh, probation violations, and we weren't really using probation and parole to the best of our abilities. So we had a bill that actually invested about uh, $200 million over that same period, uh, avoided spending the $2.1 billion. Uh, and our crime, uh, our incarceration rate, which was uh, ticking up steadily up until that point, uh, had a uh, abrupt shift and started heading downward. And we've made subsequent reforms uh, since then, most Mostly uh, strengthening uh, our community correction system and allowing better use of that through uh, risk assessment. You know, making sure the people that we're putting on the community correction uh, dockets are actually uh, an appropriate risk to be there, and not just ones we're putting there because the instant offense perhaps uh, is not necessarily one that suggests a violent uh, criminal history. Um, but then, if you look at what we're doing this year, you know, we've progressed. That was 2007. You know, the campaign here launched in 2010. Uh, 2017. What we're looking at here uh, is any 
number of things, from reclassifica- uh, reclassifying some of our state jail felony level offenses. Now, Texas is one of the uh, one of the weirder states, I would say, insofar as that we actually have uh, three tiers of facility. You know, almost every state has county jails and state prisons, but we actually have a, a band of facility known as state jails, uh, which tend to be the places where we house our state jail felons, which is like basically our fourth degree our fourth degree felonies. Um, these are mostly drug uh, drug offenses, uh, some violent offenses too. So one of the strategies we're looking at here, is, and I also have to preface this as saying our uh, recidivism outcomes from those particular facilities are horrible. You know, if you look at the uh, recidivism outcome coming out of our prisons, which is ostensibly a higher risk population, you know, 25 to 30 uh, percent recidivism. You look coming out of you look coming out of the state jails, and we're talking, you know, almost 70 percent. So people people that uh, you're going to be seeing again shortly. So what we're looking at is reclassifying that band of offenses so that they, that certain possession offenses move down to a class A, and uh, if we are going to incarcerate on that, using what's known as a uh, a safe P, a substance abuse felony probation facility, uh, which is essentially a, a, I don't want to say a halfway house because it's definitely not uh, that uh, unrestrictive, but it's a facility that is uh, more of a short-term incarceration, but a high, high concentrated dose of rehabilitation. So expanding that, uh, lots of states can do that. A lot of states can also, and I know that um, Illinois was looking at this recently, uh, adjusting their felony uh, theft thresholds. We actually had one of the highest in the country at uh, $1,500 to trigger our state jail felonies for theft. We actually raised that last session to 2500 to keep pace with inflation, and our property crime has not suffered for it. Um, yeah, and I know Illinois specifically is looking at some bail reform. You know, bail reform is a big public safety issue. Um, the problem is with the extant bail system is that we're treating someone's ability to come up with 500 Hundred dollars an adequate risk proxy, and and that's not that's not an accurate uh, that's not an accurate assessment at all. The left doesn't like it because they think it's discriminating against the poor. The right doesn't like it because whether or not you have five hundred dollars is not is a very poor measure of whether or not you're a risk to public safety. So these are things that again where we kind of come to the same area, but uh, through different paths. And a lot of these issues widespread across the country. I would recommend for everybody to check out the work that the Right on Crime campaign does. A lot of good stuff. Uh, Derek Cohen, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time today. Merry Christmas. Oh, Merry Christmas to you guys.